And we are going to get to listen to Matt Andrews, who is a new professor at Yale. I was like, shh. And also the director of um, what's called Nebraska Upstore, which helps encourage more research and science around the state. And previous to coming to UNL, he was at Oregon State University, and before that, in Minnesota. And then he grew up in Michigan. And so, um, I, he's here. And so today he's going to talk to us about some biomedical applications that he has been able, he and his lab have been able to discover through studying hibernation in ground schools. All right, great, thank you. Hey, thanks for this invitation. This is my first time out to SCC. And um, I, let me just tell you a little bit about myself besides uh, Misty's very nice introduction. Um, I've been in Lincoln now for about four months. And I, um, I started my new job um, as the director of Nebraska EPSCOR on July 1. EPSCOR, that's an acronym, E-P-S-C-O-R established program to stimulate competitive research. And we reach out throughout the state. Uh, we support research um, at um, the university level, like at UNL, UNO, uh, UNMC, but also we support research and STEM education um, in middle schools, high schools. I would really like to get involved more with community colleges. Uh, places like uh, NWU, Doan, we're statewide. And that's because, you know, there's nothing really more important than the human imagination and all the things that we can think of and all the things that we wonder about. And I think it's wonderment that really brings people to college. I think it's wonderment that really makes people think about science. And whenever you wonder about something, you're actually taking that first step of being a scientist. You may not know it, but you are. And when I think about wonderment, you know, I think, for example, uh, when I was very young, I noticed there would be a puddle of water in the backyard. Um, it was on this cement surface where we would play basketball, you know, where you have the hoop up on the garage. And this puddle of water would be there. And I'd see that puddle of water in the morning after it rained. But by the afternoon, it was gone. It wasn't there anymore. That puddle was completely gone. And, um, and so I would say to my mom, I think I was four at the time, you know, what happened to that water that we saw this morning? She said, it evaporated. Well, you know, I didn't know what that meant. That was a word. It evaporated. What does that mean? And I think when you wonder what is evaporation, how does it work, now you've taken that step. You're on that path to becoming a scientist yourself. And so where I see wonderment is things like in, oh, elementary schools. You know, like, do you guys remember like in elementary school or maybe in middle school where you would have something like a science fair? Does anyone remember science fairs at all? Where you'd have displays and things like that in the gym or in the cafeteria? And so a common thing that you would see in a science fair would be like these boards. You know, you'd have these poster boards and you'd make, you'd have a display. And so, I use this sort of thing myself when I teach. And, um, and so I think this is a good place to start. And so I'm going to tell you the whole story. I was going to talk for about 40 minutes, actually. But I can show you the whole 40 minutes on one board. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. And then after that, we're going to follow our wonderment. And by that, I mean we're going to say, wait a minute. How does he know these things? Where did this information come from? Okay. So here we go. We're going to open this up like this. All right? And so I have some pretty big pictures here. Um, folks in the back may not necessarily be able to see these OK. But let's start with this one right here. This is the 13-line ground squirrel. How many people have seen these before? Kind of like a chipmunk, sometimes called a striped gopher. They're a real pain for people who work at cemeteries, golf courses, gardeners, um, because they make holes that are about this big. And that's because they live under the ground. And one of those things that I talked about in terms of wonderment is that about this time of year, they disappear. You don't see them at all. And you don't see them again until like March or so. Where do they go? Not only are they living underground, 
but they're hibernating. And when they hibernate, and here I am holding one, one of these in my hands, because it curls up into a tight little ball, and it spends the entire winter like that, and it's hibernating. And I think when most people think of hibernation, what do you think of? What's the first animal you think of? Bears. Bears, you bet. And bears do hibernate. But in the scientific laboratory setting, a bear is not a good animal to study. I mean, they're big, and they can get mean, and you don't want to work on an experimental system that could potentially eat you. So you don't study bears. But there's other th animals that one can study and still understand what hibernation is. So these critters found all throughout the state of Nebraska. Easy to trap, easy to bait, some sunflower seeds, a live trap, no problem. They're easy to catch and bring back to the laboratory. You guys recognize this white critter right here? Rat. Now a rat, that's your sort of standard laboratory animal, the white rat, okay? And people are pretty familiar with that in the laboratory setting, not necessarily ground squirrels. Okay, why am I showing you this? Because these ground squirrels hibernate, they can live under conditions when they're hibernating that would kill everyone in this room. And these conditions are the following, the big three. Body temperature. Our body temperature is 37 degrees C. That's that classic 98.6 Fahrenheit. You're familiar with all that, right? That's our warm body temperature that all of our metabolism takes place in. It's our re own personal reaction vessel. And it's working at 98.6. Same thing with these guys. But when they're hibernating, it's down to like four or five degrees C. So that's like 38, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a cool winter morning, okay? 38 degrees, something like that. That would kill us. We would be gone immediately. That's called profound hypothermia. Yet these animals are fine. Heart rate. These guys, when they're awake and active, they have a heart re rate of anywhere from 300 to 400 beats per minute. A really rapid heart rate like that's pretty common for small mammals. Actually, the really small animals, like a hummingbird, for example, can have a heart rate of like 500, 600 beats per minute. Really common. When they hibernate, it's more like four or five beats per minute. Well, four or five beats per minute for you and I, that's a heart attack. There is not enough circulation in the system. There is no way they're gonna get enough blood around our body for that to work. These guys are fine. They're perfectly fine. The last thing, oxygen consumption. You know, we breathe in air all the time. We're just breathing it in. We don't even think about it that we're breathing in all this air. But when they are hibernating, their oxygen consumption is about 2% of normal, okay? 2%, about 1 50th of what they normally take in. For you and I, that'd be a stroke. Not enough oxygen to the brain, boom, those brain cells are gone. Probably in about five minutes they're gone. And you're not gonna recover from that, okay? That's death. So they survive all these death scenarios. And it is because of that that the Pentagon, the US Army, came to us and said, this is a real problem. We're currently fighting conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. And some of you may have friends or relatives who have been involved in those conflicts. And there were too many kids dying from blood loss. Dying and they could have been saved. And by that I mean because of a piercing injury, whether it was a roadside bomb, a bullet, something like that, they were starting to bleed. If you could get, stop the bleeding, like with a tourniquet or something, and give them a transfusion, they would have lived. But because so many of these accidents happen on some remote mountaintop in Afghanistan or some isolated village in Iraq, they couldn't get to them fast enough. So the Army said, we know that you have these critters right here, and they can live in those extremes of no oxygen delivery. Can you help our soldiers buy time so that if they're not getting oxygen delivery because of blood loss, you could buy time so that you could get them in a helicopter, get them in an ambulance, get them to a hospital and save a life by extending this window of time. There's a special name for this window of time. It's called the golden hour. And actually, it's more like the golden 20 minutes. And it happens all the time around the country, here in Lincoln. If you have someone who's in a car accident, 
and they lose a bunch of blood, the ambulance has to get to them, pick them up, get them to that hospital really quick because there's not very much time between, before, between be, that accident and when cells in the heart and the brain begin to die. But if you could immediately administer something that puts that injured person into a state similar to hibernation, something called suspended animation, you could extend that window of time and save a life. Okay, so I just told you that story in about, no, oh, I'll say seven, six, seven minutes. All right, that's the story that I'm going to now tell you because now we're going to wonder, wait a minute, how did they do that? How did they go from this guy right here that's running around the fields in Nebraska, it spends the winter like this, figure out how it spends the winter like this, and then how that can be translated, and that's the word, translated to saving lives. So that's what we're going to talk about today, okay? All right, so I'm now gonna put away my high school science project, all right? Gone. And instead, we're gonna talk about all the steps that were in between and the wonderment of, I wonder how that ground squirrel spends the winter, why it disappears, to how that can end up saving the lives of soldiers and people around the world, all right? So let's start with that right now. So you guys already have a really good idea of what's going on. 13 line ground squirrel, the hibernator. It hibernates in the lab. And let's see, where's that pointer? Maybe I covered it up. Yep, there it is. It's under the science project. Oh, not that one. Maybe that one? No, not that one. Next to the green circle. Right here? OK, great, thanks. And then this is the pointer. That's what it looks like when it hibernates. That's where these guys are found, right here. So you see Nebraska right in the middle, OK? So essentially from the Ohio Valley west to the Continental Divide, so the highest parts of North America, they're not on the other sides of that. But right through here in the Great Plains and sandy soils, that's where they naturally live. Here's something that maybe you didn't know, but it's important that we do know. Hibernation is found all throughout the mammals. All the land-dwelling orders of mammals. Notice I said land-dwelling. I'm not talking about dolphins and whales and things like that. But land-dwelling animals, all of them, except for the hooved mammals, have at least one hibernating species. And here's our 13 line ground squirrel right here. But if you notice, bats, marmots, marmots, by the way, woodchucks, um, groundhogs, all the same thing. Uh, certain marsupials, like these guys right, right, right here, and even primates, primates like us, are hibernators, or they have the ability to hibernate. So for example, see this primate species right here? This is the fat-tailed lemur. This is called a prosimian hibernator, okay? And by prosimian, I mean these are little guys. Let me hit the lights here so you can see them a little bit better. See that right there? They're not that big, about the size of maybe my fist, something like that. But they're primates. But they've separated from the human lineage about 55 million, 60 million years ago. All of us in the room right now, we're great apes. We belong with the gorillas, the chimpanzees, orangutans. These guys, these prosimians, have the ability to hibernate. And that's because they have a dry season when food is gone. They're not big enough to compete with other animals to find food. And so they go into a state of torpor. Torpor is a word that I'm gonna tell you about right uh, just a little bit later. But I just wanted to show you how widespread hibernation is. But for studying in the laboratory, we're gonna stick with the 13 line ground scroll right here. Something that's easy to get, something I can find anywhere here in town, I'll tell you where there's quite a few. You know that cemetery that's on O? It's like between. Why is that? Is that it? Yeah, if you go, and it's on the right. If you go down O towards downtown, they're all over the place there. OK? All right? And they hibernate. All right. I've told you about this. When the heart rate is active, when the animal's active, a very rapid heart rate. When it hibernates, a very slow hibernate. I mean, a very slow heart rate. 
Very low oxygen consumption, very low body temperature. For you and I, what is this, guys? It starts with a D? Death. Death. You bet. We will not survive this. Okay? But these guys do. Something else we need to know about hibernation. When an animal hibernates, like this right here, like the picture I showed you, that's called torpor. T-O-R-P-O-R. And the reason I want to show you this is because the hibernation season is actually a roller coaster of body temperature. A lot of people thought, and I did too, when I was wondering about hibernation, that they spend the entire winter like this, curled up in a little ball. But no, about every week or two, they actually wake up. They'll reposition themselves. Sometimes they'll urinate. Then they go right back into torpor again. And they're up and down, up and down, up and down all winter long. No one knows why that happens. But there are some ideas that there are certain biological reactions that take place in their body that only work at warm temperatures. So they have to warm up to do that. Have you guys heard of RNA? You guys have heard of protein? If you're going to make those things, and there's special names for how you make those things, transcription, translation, that's only going to happen at a warm body temperature. So they have to warm up. This is usually less than 24 hours. So a bout of torpor, T-O-P-O-R, tor a torpor bout is interrupted by these inner bout arousals. Inner bout arousals, or IBA. Can you see where the ground squirrel is just like sort of poking his head out right here, all right? And then he goes back down again. There's a holiday that sort of celebrates this. Does anyone know what it's called? It's on February 2nd. You bet, absolutely. So that's kind of cool that hibernation actually has its own holiday. Not too many science, scientific disciplines have their own holiday. Have you guys heard of uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly? I mean, what are they gonna have, rotten fruit day? You know, there's no good holiday for most science, but we have Groundhog Day to celebrate the IBAs. All right, when they arouse, it's fast. They go from these single digit temperatures, like five degrees, all the way up to 37, from cold to warm, really quickly. In fact, their body temperature will leap 20 degrees in 52 minutes. You know what that's like? That's like you getting a fever instantly. A fever that would make you so hot you wouldn't believe it. So hot that you wouldn't, you, you, you know, you would, you'd never have a fever that, that hot. And so, but they actually will heat right up like that during these inner bout arousals. Their heart rate will go up from a really low heart rate, that's the red line, to up here around 300 beats per minute. So body temperature and heart rate both explode in a short amount of time. Okay, here's our first lesson, that explosion, all right? And that's because whenever someone loses blood, like the soldiers we talked about, it's not a simple matter to us, well, we'll just give them more blood so they'll be okay. Normally, when you do something like that, you risk injury. It's a special kind of injury called reperfusion injury. And reperfusion injury can be almost as bad as losing the blood in the first place. So these animals, their blood flow, their body temperature explodes like this, but they're fine. So that's one thing we have to keep in mind. The other thing is, is that here's what the whole year looks like for these guys. If you look at body temperature here at 37 degrees, during the whole year, April, May, June, July, August, September, even in October, they're really like humans. They'll stay 37 degrees like we do. We don't change much at all. Your body temperature goes down a little bit at night when you sleep. Maybe a half a degree when you sleep. Maybe a degree, but not much. But then they hit hibernation and they get this bumpy road of torpor, inner bowel arousal, torpor, inner bowel arousal, torpor, inner bowel arousal. And that bumpy road is bad because when you don't get enough blood at this low level, that's a special word, ischemia, I-S-C-H-E-M-I-A. A heart attack causes ischemia, a stroke causes ischemia. But then when the blood comes back, that's reperfusion, which also can be bad. It's reperfusion injury. So these guys, survive during ischemia, they survive during reperfusion. Here's our next question, how, okay? And so the way that can be tested is by a number of different methods. All this is, this, this word right here, metabolomics, all that means is let's look at the biochemicals that are in the animal at certain times of the year. 
And one of the ways that we did this was to use this big magnet right here. This is a magnet sort of like, oh, like an MRI. So you guys are probably familiar with MRIs. You know how like at a hospital, any hospital here in town really, your whole body goes in and you can have your head imaged. Or let's say you're going to have, you've done some damage to your knee. Like I tore some cartilage in my knee doing something stupid. And, um, and so then they imaged to see how the cartilage was torn. So then the doctor would know how to go in and remove the bad, the torn cartilage. Okay, so you get images. This is one just like that, except it's made for rodents. So do you see this word right here? A, a 31 centimeter bore right here? All that is, the bore is the hole in the middle of the magnet. And so you can put rodents in there. And when you put rodents in there, you not only will get the same images, but it also can tell you what chemicals are there. And that's called nuclear magnetic resonance. And that's not important. But it's just the way this NMR is a way you can ask the way chemicals work in the body of these rodents. And so as a result, you have to get the animal ready. So there's a hibernating animal. Do you notice we pack it in ice right here? The reason we pack it in ice is so that it doesn't warm up. It stays in hibernation. And then after that, you keep it cold by putting in blue ice. Are you guys familiar with blue ice? You know, you put it in the picnic basket or the cooler or whatever if you're going, you know, keep stuff cold. See this thing right here? 20 ounce Coke bottle. You know, the kind that you get in the vending machines that you pay too much money for in the vending machines. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking about here? It's like a buck fifty a bottle or something like that. Way too much. But round scroll fits in it perfectly and it creates a great seal, okay, around the ground squirrel. So you got your blue ice, you have your ground squirrel, the ground squirrel's in hibernation, you're keeping it cold, you put it in this thing that is like an eaves trough, eaves trough, or a gutter, you know, the kind of thing that's on the side of a house, collects the water, fills up with leaves this time of year, you gotta go in and clean it out, and that's a pain, right? But something like that's a great way to take these ground squirrels, and you put them right in this long eaves trough, you put a special magnetic coil on their head. That's, that's a person who worked in my lab. You see this right here, the big eaves trough? There's the ground scroll right there. You take the whole thing and you put it in the magnet, okay? Because the ground squirrel's in hibernation. It's not voluntarily going to go in the magnet, all right? So you take the whole thing, you put it in the magnet. And when you do that, you can start to image the brain and you can start to see in various parts of the brain, this is a part of the brain called the hippocampus. This is a part called the cortex. In you and I, sometimes called um, cerebral hemispheres, cerebrum or something like that, same thing. Um, and when you do that in that heavy magnet, that big magnet, you can actually look at all these different chemicals. They all have different names, but what you're doing is you're painting a picture of all the molecules that are in the brain when it's hibernating. You do the same thing when the animal's warm and awake, and you ask the questions, what's going on there that allows it to survive during hibernation? Okay, so remember our science project. We went from an animal in hibernation to a therapy. This can start to inform us about the therapy, okay? So now we're starting to ask questions to get to our original idea of can we use some of this to help put a soldier in a state of hibernation? All this information on all these different brain chemicals. And the reason you look at the brain is because it's very sensitive to ischemia in reperfusion injury. You know, um, let me give you a couple examples. Have you ever heard of these stories where like a child will fall through the ice in a lake? It'll be like in the wintertime. And they'll fall through the ice. And they'll be underwater for maybe 40 minutes, sometimes even as long as an hour. And they're able to go down there, fish that child out of there, and sometimes revive it. And so it has a perfectly normal life. And that's because the body temperature has cold, cooled so much in that icy cold water that now the metabolism and the need for oxygen is greatly reduced. And so they're almost like in a state of hibernation, preserved 
for that hour, okay? Now, if that same child falls into a swimming pool in Florida or Hawaii, well, in five or six minutes, that's a drowning because that's warm water. And so the metabolism and the cells are still working and saying, I don't have enough oxygen here. And next thing you know, uh, you have an event where the brain cells begin to die. But in the cold, they can be protected. This is what the hibernators do naturally, okay? All right, so this is where we've gathered our information. I just wanna know if there's anyone in the audience who has any questions so far. Yes? So you guys, when you were studying the squirrels, did you uh, induce a state of hibernation? Yes, and it's not hard to do either. After you catch them in your Nebraska field, what we do is we put them in a walk-in refrigerator, turn off the lights and remove the food, and out they go. So you, that's how easy it is to induce hibernation in captivity. Now, you can only do it in the fall, and they have to be fat. They have to be really, really fat. Fat is such a good and wonderful thing for a hibernator. And the main reason for that is, is because they have their last supper in September or October, and they don't eat again until April. So that's six months with no food. So imagine going from like Halloween to Easter, and you're not eating anything in between. There is no Thanksgiving, there is no Christmas, there's none of that stuff. And so they're burning entirely their body fat, and that's how they live. So if they're fat enough, yes. The answer to your question is yes. You can induce the um, hibernation in the laboratory. That was a really good question, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, what's the reason you can't do it like in July, just because you stick with the calendar? Um, that's, that's one thing. But the other thing, too, is that they're too thin then. They will have just come out of the previous hibernation bout, and they haven't had an opportunity to fatten. The main reason they haven't had the opportunity to fatten is because the growing season hasn't caught up. You know what I'm saying? There's not as many things for them to eat like that. But you're right. You said the calendar. And there is certain things like the angle of the sun, temperature of the air, um, things like that, and the abundance of food really sort of tells them when to hibernate. So you're right. Those are called circannual rhythms. You probably have heard of circadian rhythms. That's sort of like one circadian, one day. Circannual means a whole year. And so you're right. In June, it's like too early. But the big reason is, is that I can experimentally force an animal to hibernate in June, but I've got to make sure that they're very well fed, you know, that they have a lot of fat. I think there's a signal from the fat to the brain that says, I can hibernate now. Mm -hmm. That's another good question. Anything else? All right, let's keep going now. So we know about these brain chemicals. And so we know about hibernation. Lowered metabolism. Hypothermia. What's hypothermia mean? Cold. Yeah, the body's cold. Yep. Um, lowered metabolism means you don't need as much oxygen. You don't need the nutrients. Elevated antioxidants. Here's something worth talking about. Um, you know, your body produces chemicals to scavenge, like little sponges, to soak up reactive oxygen species. Essentially, your body will rust away. If, um, uh, just like a piece of metal can rust, your body can rust away if you don't protect it from, um, from reactive oxygen species. And these are things like, oh, I don't know, you probably heard of some of these things, hydroxyl, hydroxyl anions and, um, hydronium, uh, uh, things that are looking for electrons. And that's what causes this oxidation and this rusting of your body. Um, but these antioxidants take care of a lot of that. Uh, common antioxidants, um, vitamin C. It's a good water-soluble one. Uh, vitamin E is a fat-soluble one. But what we found in the hibernator was one that you would never expect. Melatonin. Melatonin. You know, melatonin a lot of times is thought as this sort of like sleep aid, day, night, light, dark sort of hormone. People sometimes take it to overcome jet lag, but it's a really a potent antioxidant. And it's an ancient molecule. Now, what do I mean by an ancient molecule? I mean, it's a molecule that's been around a long time. And the way we know that is because you can find this molecule in critters that don't sleep and don't, aren't sensitive to day and night. And by that, I shouldn't probably use the word critter. Bacteria, 
things called archaebacteria, which have been on the planet a long, long time. They have melatonin. And so it's a really effective antioxidant. And then finally, ketone bodies. And if you look at this, this is this, this four carbon, one, two, three, four. Instead of burning sugar, sugar which can generate acid in the form of lactic acid, they use these ketone bodies. These ketone bodies come from that body fat. It's made in the liver. It goes from the fat to the liver. And these things can fuel all sorts of wonderful processes in your body. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It can fuel the heart. It's a wonderful fuel source. And maybe some of you even heard of something like a ketogenic diet or an Atkins-like diet. This is the fuel source for those sorts of things. And was that the question I was going to? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. So these animals sort of go on an Atkins-like diet when they're living off their fat. But they're also turning up antioxidants like melatonin. And you know, there's a whole industry in, 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 uh, about selling antibiotics. I mean, I mean antioxidants, and you guys are familiar with this. It's vitamins, you know. You'll hear on TV the importance of taking multiple vitamins and stuff like that. You know, most all those things you get in your food. You know, there might be a few isolated trace minerals you might not get in your diet, but in general, you get all that in your food anyway. I, don't, I used to take multiple vitamins because I believe the commercials, you know? Um, and I, I really like the way that the Flintstones vitamins tasted because, you know, they tasted kind of like candy. And so, I, yeah, I, I always look forward to that. Then I realized, wait a minute, I don't need these things. You know, there are certain ones that certain people may need. Sometimes I'll take a D supplement in the winter um, because, you know, the active form of D is converted by sunlight in your skin. In the winter, I don't get enough of that, so um, sometimes I'll take a D supplement. But in general, those are antioxidants too. But the ground squirrel uses melatonin. So here's the hibernation strategies. Taking hibernation strategies for the purposes of avoiding ischemia and reperfusion injury of the heart and brain. That's a heart attack and a stroke. Maybe we could apply hibernation to helping cure the damage that would occur from hibernation and stroke. All right? That might be a long way off, but we now know about these animals that can do this naturally. Improve storage of donor organs. You know, I think all you guys are familiar with transplantation and transplanting organs, but did you know that when you donate an organ, it's got to go into another patient really quickly, all right? If it's an abdominal organ, okay, now look at me here, guys, liver, kidney, Abdominal organs, you can put these things in a cold solution for about 24 hours before it goes into someone else. But longer than a day, you're throwing that organ away. Last year in the United States, 3,500 kidneys were thrown away, primarily because there was not a recipient that could take that tissue match at that particular time. You can't bank organs. You know, you can bank blood. If you need AB positive, if you need O negative, you can go to any hospital here in town and get the blood you need because you can bank blood, but you can't bank organs. If you need an organ, more than likely you're waiting for someone else to die. But if you could take donated organs and put them in a state of hibernation, now you, maybe you could have organ banks. And so now organs would be more readily available, something the hibernators do naturally. Finally, Surviving profound blood loss, hemorrhagic shock. Hemorrhagic shock is when those soldiers lose a lot of blood, they go into shock, okay? And this happens in the civilian sector for any sort of trauma. So, you saw this before, military need, where soldiers get injured. This is the golden hour where they're getting evacuated. You don't want them to die in transit. If you find them and they're still alive, and so what you want to do is you want to equip them with something that they can either self-administer or that they're outfitted with, like with a little pump device. So I have a sister-in-law who is diabetic, and she wears this little pump. It's under her waist. It's like a little pump that's right there, and it'll dispense insulin. These are really common. But a soldier could take one of these fill it with hibernation solution, and it has a pressure transducer on it. And by that I mean, you get hit by the bullet, your blood pressure is gonna go down, but then that would trigger putting that solution into your body while your heart's still beating, okay? So now the hibernation solution is all throughout your body. 
You might black out, you might pass out, but all the cells in your body are still alive. So that if you're found, you can save a life. That's, that's the goal of something like this. And so the study that was done was to take all that information we had on hibernation and subject rats to 60% blood loss. Why rats? Rats are like humans. They don't hibernate, okay? So remember what I told you about inducing hibernation? If you took a rat and you put it in the cold and took away its food and turned off the lights, it would just get mad, you know? It would be cold and hungry. It's not gonna hibernate, okay? And it's like humans, all right? 60% blood loss. 60% blood loss means you're taking out a lot of blood. For rats, humans, most mammals, 60% blood loss, that means death in about seven minutes. The heart stops beating, okay? Needs to be portable. Why portable? Why this small volume? So you can wear it on your body. So you can self-administer it. So you can inject it if you have to, you know, kind of like an EpiPen, you know? It ha but it has to be portable. So those are the demands that our funding group called DARPA from the, uh, from the Pentagon wanted us to do. And let me tell you what 60% blood loss is like for a rat. This is how much blood is in a rat. 18 mils, 300 gram rat, 18 mils. If you're gonna remove 60% of 18, so even I can do that math, 18 times 0.6, you're gonna have like about 11 mils of blood that you're gonna be taking out. But if you're gonna replace at one mil per kilogram, you're only gonna put in 300 microliters, which is like a third of one mil. You're gonna take out all of this, you're only gonna put in that. So you're not going to be replacing all that blood, but you're gonna be putting something into the body that protects the cells, so that when you finally get the person back to the hospital, they're still alive. Okay, almost like a hibernator. They're in a state of suspended animation. Those are our chemicals, that ketone. There's melatonin, by the way, right there, folks. Safe at high doses in humans, no known LD50, that means not known to kill you at all. You know, you can buy this stuff at the high V. I bet you've probably even seen it there, you know. So it's, it's very common, very easy to get a hold of. The rat experiment, you take the blood out, you add your therapy, you get more blood out after 60% blood loss. After one hour, you put the blood back. Let's see if the rat still lives. If you don't add the therapy, the rat's gonna die about right there. See that? Shortly after the 60% blood loss, the rat will be gone. But these rats lived for another hour. Actually, they lived for three hours. In this experiment, we returned the blood. This is just a graph showing that we can do that. Over 240 hours, 240 hours, how many days would that be? 10, right, 24 hours in a day, okay. After 10 days, 80% of the rats were still alive. We were able to improve that, so we got 100% of the rats to stay alive. Here are some modifications of that chemical therapy. It didn't work as well. And so now it was time to enlist these guys. These are the army surgeons. These are the people that are gonna be in the field administering these sorts of drugs. This particular person, Greg Bielman, is also um, a faculty member at the University of Minnesota. Here he is in Iraq on a typical Iraq day, I think, summer day, I think it was like 120 degrees is what it says right there. And so what they do is, um, what the Army guys do is they use pig models. And that's because the pigs are more like humans in terms of their size, in terms of their circulatory system. But they also use this thing called polytrauma. And so rather than what I did with the rats, where I just took a little bit of blood out, 60% of the blood, they do the same thing, but they do it via a trauma model. Because in the wharf time scenario, you're not gonna be carefully taken out of the blood, you know, through a vein or something like that. You step on a landmine, you know, you lose a leg. You get hit by a barrage of bullets, your lip, liver might get ruptured, your lungs might get torn apart. So that's the sort of, that's what's meant by polytrauma. When they did that with the pigs, 13 of the 14 pigs, that's the black line right there, lived just fine. And that's for the 48 hours that we did the experiment, for two days. If you lower the melatonin, you see less and less and less survival. See this red line right here? The red line? That's the current standard of care. 
So the current standard of care, if you're in an accident, have you ever seen, for example, probably on TV, someone on a stretcher going in an ambulance and there's an IV bag hanging above them, an IV bag. That's called lactated ringers. That's the current standard of care. You can see right here that the hibernation solution, in terms of survival, look at the y-axis here, survival does much better than lactated ringers. So that would be a real improvement in patient care after trauma. So when you do that, you have to go to the FDA, and the FDA has to approve your drug. So this is our meeting that we had with the FDA a few years ago. That's me when I had more hair, <laughs> right there. And, um, and so we got FDA approval to go ahead and now to try, and try this with humans. And with humans, the first thing is, it's just healthy volunteers to make sure that what we're putting in them is safe. I'm not worried about that. It's, it's less melatonin than you would take if you were jet, well, it's a little more melatonin than you would take for jet lag. It's a whole lot less in terms of the beta hydroxybutyrate that's found in certain diabetic patients. In fact, certain diabetics, sometimes the level of the ketones are so high, you can sometimes almost smell like an acetone on their breath. So it's not even that high. So I think it's probably gonna be uh, safely tolerated. Those, those experiments are being planned. But anyway, now you see how we went from here to here to here down to here, okay? Where that bottom panel right there is where we did the same thing in pigs. And now we've gone from here to off the board to someplace over here where we're starting to get, to get work doing it with humans. So you can see the distance from going from an animal that runs around in the fields here in Nebraska to maybe saving human lives. And you can see all the stuff in between, trying to understand what all the chemicals are at these various times of year. So that's an application of hibernation. One that's coming up is this one right here. NASA invited us to give a talk with the idea of putting people in hibernation for long distance space travel. Now the reason for that may not be immediately obvious, but if you're gonna have a long distance space trip, okay, and by that I'm talking about Mars and back. You know, going from here to Mars is nine months. And then you have to be on the planet for a while, waiting for Earth and Mars to realign, then you have a launch window, and then it's another nine months back. So that's probably gonna be a, a two year trip, okay? So, food, air, water, clothes, medical supplies for a crew of six for two years, there would be, the, the, the estimates I'm hearing would be the same as sending up 60 space shuttles to carry all that, and that's just not practical. But if you could put the astronauts in a state of hibernation where you would take a craft that'd be equipped where you'd have folks in something like this right here, well now those first three I spoke about, food, air, water, that's greatly reduced. You don't need nearly as much when you're in suspended animation. Something like this, probably decades away, because we can understand how animals who we have evolved with the ability to do this can do it, but for a whole human, it would probably be a, not a cold hibernation as much as a sort of a cool hibernation. Maybe getting them down to like 30 degrees C, which would be like 80 degrees in the Fahrenheit range, something like that. Do you notice how like they're all equipped here with um, things like getting their nutrients, making sure that they have, they're properly hydrated, that kind of stuff. So that kind of stuff is the future. However, I don't think it's that distance of the future. Maybe not in my life, but probably in your life, that kind of thing will happen. And so that just gives you an idea of how wondering where these critters go in the wintertime can take you. It can take you across the solar system, all right? And so what I want to leave you with is a couple things. Never stop wondering because, wow, 
When you wonder, then you start to imagine. When you start to imagine, you come up with ideas. And when you come up with ideas, you can solve real problems. Okay? And then the other thing is, is that when you look at something like this right here, it's always cool to ask, how does it do it? Ask questions about it. How does that puddle on the basketball court, court, uh, on the basketball court actually disappear? You know? I think that's just one of those things that you guys should always want to have that sort of inner curiosity because it, you never know where it'll lead you. So that's my story and that's my presentation. And I'm really happy to answer any questions that you may have about this. Yeah. Uh, so at the end there when you were talking about like using the hibernation for space travel yeah. potentially. So if humans were to go into long-term hibernation, wouldn't they need uh, the interbout arousal periods as well? We don't know. Probably. But maybe if they're not in a, a real state of cold, you're still keeping them warm enough for those biochemical reactions I told you about. Remember I told you about RNA and protein? Those are called macromolecules. When you use the word macro, what does macro mean? Big. Those are big molecules. And it takes a lot of energy to make those. So you might be at a temperature where you could still do that. But there might, yeah, you might have to do a little bit of heat up. That's one of the things that we're talking about in my laboratory right now. In my lab, what we're coming up with now are some strategies for the organ preservation thing I spoke to you about. And it, you might have to take these organs in storage, which are currently, you know, what you do is you put them in these cold solutions and you leave them cold. But how about if the organs went through inner bowel arousals? You know, you had little, some periods of warming so that they could resume maybe some physiological homeostasis where they would be able to work a little bit, and then you cool them off again. And then a day or two later, you warm them up, and then you cool them off. We're doing experiments along those kinds of lines. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a really good question. Okay, so the way something like that works, when you have something that goes to the FDA, then that's called intellectual property, and that is, usually can uh, lead to a product and commercialization. So the first thing you do is that after you collect all your data, then you uh, apply for a patent, okay? And, when you, and sometimes you have to have a, a, a few different patents. Applying for a patent is not cheap. And often at times of, uh, um, requires that you hire lawyers and all this kind of stuff. So if you have all those sorts of protections on that, and all the patent says, folks, is that someone else can't invent this too and beat you, beat you, to, the, beat you to the punch with that, uh, then the FDA will say, OK, we see your data. We've seen that you've protected it. Uh, we'll now have one of these meetings. And that meeting is called a pre-IND meeting, IND, Investigational New Drug. And they're willing to give those to you. Because if you've got something that's going to save lives, um, they'll listen to hear what you have to say. So um, not difficult, but costly. Because you have to have all the right sort of filings and attorneys and all these sorts of things. The attorneys have to check, for example, um, has someone already thought about this? Let's say someone else already came up with this hibernation idea. It was 12 years ago. They invented it in Sweden. We had no idea they invented it in Sweden. Well, the attorneys will find that out for you. You know, they, they look into all that kind of stuff. Of course, you know, when they do that kind of stuff for you, um, their clock is ticking, and so you get a bill. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's not hard to do if you have a great idea. Mm -hmm. But there is some cost involved. Most of the times, universities and other entities are willing to bear that cost because they are hoping that then someday this will be a product that will then um, make money. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, can this be used to save other animals? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, so I mean, we've already done it with pigs and rats. So I, I, I think you could. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly correct. Yeah. No. So this this really is an example of all of us mammals. We have certain reactions in common. You and I and dogs and cats have 98% have of all the same biochemical reactions. And because you and I and dogs and cats have all those same biochemical reactions, there are certain therapies that would work in us and work in them. 
And that's not true with all things. You know, there's certain drugs and receptors and things like that that don't work in the veterinary setting. But I'm talking about other mammals. Now, let's say you have a sick um, goldfish. Well, then it may not necessarily work. That's, that's a long ways from a mammal. Mm -hmm. But a dog and a cat, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Other questions? All right. So listen, if you have little brothers or little sisters and they have a science fair, go to it. And uh, make sure that you uh, pay attention to what they're talking about because you never know what that is. You never know where it could lead. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I got to put away my science fair now. How long has this been going on? Like, I would say I should have said that. About 12 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a long time, but it's like we're finally getting somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, 12 years ago, I, you never would have known. Yeah. Mm -hmm.